All right. Welcome back, everybody, <laughs> to the Dharma Doors. Uh, MC Owens here, and you're in the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, so tonight's a reg it's a night like any other night here at the Dharma Doors, right? Um, so last week I started something new, which was I started making the Dharma Doors class, the Sunday night class, uh, thematic meaning each night is going to have its own theme, its own subject, its own focus. And that way, each Sunday is going to be a little bit of a standalone so that if you haven't been coming, you feel more free just to drop in. So basically, there's going to be no presumption that you've been coming at all because it's just, a, it's just another Sunday night. However, for everyone who is a regular Dharma Doors attendee and for everybody who is coming, we have started a new sutra. We kind of started it last week, or at least I mentioned it. I'm going to say more about it tonight. And so in many ways, this is a very gradual, slow introduction to this sutra. So technically, I guess this is part two of the Manjushri Vyakaranya Sutra, otherwise known as the Manjushri Buddha Kshetra Gunavyuha Sutra, quite a mouthful. Um, we're going to talk probably about the title of this sutra a little bit in more depth tonight. But let me tell you what the theme is tonight. So the theme for tonight is basically enlightenment. What, what is enlightenment? And the reason why I'm making that the theme for tonight is last week's theme was basically, what's the bodhisattva? In particular, we were talking, or I was talking about the, the bodhisattva vow, the, the vow of the bodhisattva, which is basically what constitutes a bodhisattva is somebody making the bodhisattva vow. Um, one sec, I just got to turn something off. Okay. Good. So last week was about what makes one a bodhisattva. It's making this vow. And the main point that I emphasized last time is that the vow of a bodhisattva is sort of, sort of twofold. One aspect of the bodhisattva vow, vow is about attaining or arriving at a type of omniscience a type of all knowingness, all knowledge. And that's coupled with sort of a vow to see to it that all sentient beings arrive at that all knowledge, <laughs> which is usually what gets glossed as making a vow to save all sentient beings. So last week, is that's what we talked about was the bodhisattva and the basic idea is that a bodhisattva is a being of bodhi awakening enlightenment for lack of a better term and the bodhisattva is bound headed towards enlightenment and so i thought tonight we should talk about what that is now, I'm not going to tell you exactly what enlightenment is because I don't know exactly what enlightenment is. Everybody knows I'm not making any claims to enlightenment in that way. But we are going to have a great conversation about what a lot of people have said enlightenment is. We're going to have a lot of great conversation about uh, different understandings of enlightenment from different traditions. And I also, so in addition to doing some kind of historical work tonight, some language work tonight, I don't want this to be entirely abstract and hypothetical. And so to the best of my ability, I do want to try to make this practical. It, it's actually my goal is to, well, the basic idea for me is, is that if we, it's like, if we don't know where this is going, <laughs> it's kind of hard to get there. Like we don't have any sense of, of what this is supposed to lead to. It could be difficult to arrive at it in that way. And so I think tonight is gonna to be helpful for understanding um, 
Well, I wouldn't call it the goal here, but sort of the end game, <laughs> the, the end game of Dharma, put it that way. Um, yeah, so that's the theme tonight. We're going to unpack that. I'm probably going to start, I think, by um, unpacking this word enlightenment. It's actually what sort of spawned this whole, the idea for tonight was this word gets thrown around so much. And, I, you know, it's almost like I'm not exactly sure what it even means anymore. So we're going to start with that word enlightenment. Um, however, just so that it doesn't entirely get lost, the sutra that these talks are based out on or coming out of, so it's a sutra about a bodhisattva. <laughs> it's a sutra about the bodhisattva Manjushri, um, the, the, the one whose beauty, the one whose Manju is Shri. It's a kind of wonderful or auspicious. This wonderful auspicious beauty, beauty is Manjushri. Um, this is Manjushri here, one of the only images I could find of Manjushri. You can always identify Manjushri because of the sword of wisdom, the flaming sword of wisdom. And in the other, um, one hand is the flaming sword of wisdom. And on the other hand is a lotus flower upon which is blossoming a sutra, like a, a scroll or a text. That is pretty much pre-classic Manjushri iconography, the sword of wisdom and the sutra scroll. And that has a lot to do with Manjushri's really close association kind of with literature, learning, if you go to East Asian Buddhist monasteries, uh, Taiwan, Japan, mainland China, more often than not, the library of a monastery will have a big Manjushri statue, like either out in front or at center of the, of the library. So Manjushri has this really close association with, with texts, with the language in that way. So that's Manjushri, he's Bodhisattva, and we're going to, I don't know when this will happen, but we're going to learn more about Manjushri. He doesn't even appear in this sutra for a while, so, but this sutra is about, well, again, I told you there's sort of two titles. One is coming from uh, the Chinese version of this, which is translated by a monk named Shikshananda in like the sixth century. The other version is a Tibetan version that was translated from Sanskrit, probably, I would guess, in like, I don't know, 1100s, 1200s would be my guess. Not exactly sure about that. So we have two different versions of this text, which is actually really great. It's always actually really, really helpful to have different versions, especially having a, maybe a Chinese and a Tibetan, Chinese and a Sanskrit, really helpful. And interestingly, these two different versions have slightly different titles. The first title, as I mentioned, is the Manjushri Vyakaranya Sutra. And the, a Vyakaranya is a prediction. Specifically, it is a type of a sutra in which a bodhisattva receives the prediction of their future enlightenment. Uh, it, in in uh, Mahayana sutras, it sort of indicates a it's kind of a rite of passage in that sense when a bodhisattva receives the prediction, the vyakaranya. And from that title, Manjushri's prediction of enlightenment or prediction of awakening, this sutra is about this prediction that Manjushri is going to reach the goal. He's going to reach enlightenment. And so again, that's why I wanted to talk about enlightenment because that's what that the sutra is about according to the chinese title the tibetan title is that longer one the manjushri buddha kshetra guna vyuha so a vyuha a vyuha is like um oh like a, a an arrangement a bouquet of flowers or uh, like if you were talking about flowers it would be a bouquet if you were talking about a a film scene, it would be like the mise-en-scene, right? Like the arrangement of the scene. That's a vyuha. 
an arrangement, a kind of a bouquet of sorts. Guna, this kind of idea of merit, worthiness. So a guna vyuha, which is a beautiful idea of like a bouquet of merit, a bouquet of virtue. This is the bouquet of virtues or this arrangement of guna that you, you would find, I guess, in the Buddha Kshetra of Manjushri. And what a Buddha Kshetra is, is, um, well, technically it is translated as a Buddha field or just a Buddha land, or also known as a pure land. And so actually the sutra that we're kind of beginning, or we be began last week, is what would be called a, a pure land sutra. In fact, this is Manjushri's pure land sutra. This is the sutra about Manjushri's Buddha Kshetra, Manjushri's Buddha field, Buddha land, and the bouquet or arrangement of virtues that you will find there. So both of those titles, the prediction and the Buddha land, both of those events or both of those things, they do occur in the sutra. There is a moment in the sutra when Manjushri, it's actually, if, if you're familiar with the, these uh, Vyakaranya sutras, because there's a bunch of these, and if you're familiar with these, we did one where there was a magician named Bhadra and he received the prediction of enlightenment. Um, that's the most recent one that comes to mind, but it happens a lot. The way that it goes down in this sutra is wild. It's the craziest prediction of enlightenment that we're going to encounter. So that'll be fun when we get there. And there's a chapter, or it's not quite a chapter, but it's a portion of the sutra that actually talks about what Manjushri's Buddha land is going to be like when Manjushri attains enlightenment, because earlier in the sutra, he receives the prediction that he will achieve enlightenment. And then we get a description of what the virtues or the, the merit of that Buddha land will be like. So that's where the titles, the different titles come from. It's really a matter, a slight matter of difference um, in that regard. So again, before we get to all of that, I kind of want to unpack more of just this general idea of enlightenment. And for the most part, what I'm going to be doing is continuing a general line of thought that I started last week, which was, I was kind of basically in laying out the Bodhisattva path, I was doing the classic thing that is always done, which is talking about early Buddhism, the early path, the Hinayana versus the Mahayana. So I started that kind of line of thinking last week, and I'm going to continue that tonight by talking about these different understandings of enlightenment or understandings of awakening. Um, I'm also, by the way, too, again, I want to remind everybody that this new format is to invite more questions, comments, answers, ideas. So please feel free to interject at any given time. So. Okay, so now let's talk about a bunch of different words <laughs> that would all probably, maybe, possibly mean enlightenment. <laughs> or let's just start unpacking this. So I'm not exactly sure where the word enlightenment became a part of the Buddhist vernacular, in, in English, I mean. You know, enlightenment has this really close association with European history, European kind of Christian dominated history. And that term enlightenment and the enlightenment period or the enlightenment age and all of that really refers to something very specific in, in terms of advances in science and advances in all kinds of fields. And so there's a way in which just if evoking that word is like, why are we, why are we using that word? Now, of course, it has a longer uh, history and spirituality, Western spirituality as well. So it's understandable. But what's interesting is that like as a Buddhist scholar, teacher in that sense, I kind of actually, um, a few days ago, I got, I got it in my head where I was like, 
what exactly is enlightenment a translation of? What, what uh, Sanskrit or maybe Chinese or Tibetan, but what Buddhist, Buddhist word is enlightenment a translation of? And it's tricky because it actually, in all of the different English translations of Buddhist texts, enlightenment gets, is used to translate a bunch of different ideas. Um, and so it's hard to actually nail down exactly what enlightenment means when it's referring to a bunch of different things. So I'm going to unpack a few. I want to start with what is probably the, the probably, I don't want to say the right answer, but probably the one that is the closest to what enlightenment is translating. And it's the idea that we talked about last week, which is, well, Bodhi. So Bodhi, B-O-D-H-I in English, which is better translated as awakening. And then what we talked about last week was Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, supreme uh, or unsurpassable supreme awakening. And Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi is considered this awakened state of a Buddha. And what I talked about last week, of course, too, was the etymological relationship between the idea of Bodhi, awakening, and a Buddha, which is one who has attained such Bodhi. So the root of those words, Buddha, Bodhi, and then Bodhisattva, all of those words are related to the common root Bud, which does mean awakening. And as I often like to point out, the specific connotation of awakening of bud is a flower bud, because we actually get the, the English word bud from this Sanskrit root. And that bud, uh, like a flower, awakening, opening, that image of the flower opening is why... Bodhisattvas and Buddhas are always seated on lotus flowers. It's a part of the overarching metaphor of Buddhism. Now, it may not even be a metaphor. It might be actually waking up, of course, but it's this language about awakening. Bud, bud, and then Buddha and Bodhi. The thing about that is that that word, Bodhi and Bud doesn't have anything to do with light. And so enlightening, it, it, it's like it's not really an accurate translation in that way. Now, of course, culturally and the way that we use the word enlightenment and all of that, it, it can function as a translation. But I just want you to know that one of the ideas that we're going to be focusing on tonight is awakening as again, as the goal, as the end, as where this leads. So that's that idea. Um, we're, we'll come back to that because again, I'm, that's probably, not probably, it is what we mean. Um, when we're talking about a Buddha and we're talking about a Bodhisattva, it's about Bodhi. And in particular, it's about this highest type of Bodhi, Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi. Yeah, Tanya. Well, when you talk about awakening too, I mean, the thing that really comes to mind is, you know, you're talking about like, it's awakening from the dream, right? And you, a lot of times you use like the dream analogy. So, and it's interesting because enlightenment like kind of loses that whole kind of <clears throat> aspect, that word loses that whole aspect of it. Yep. Of like waking up to what really is going on. Yep. Now, there, there is a word, there's, there's a word that sort of has the connotation of enlightenment. That would basically be the word vidya. Because the opposite of vidya is avidya. And avidya is ignorance. And vidya is this, well, not <laughs> this. And the, the vidya is about light. And 
avidya means no light, <laughs> darkness. That's why they talk about the darkness of ignorance. So vidya would be a probably a good word to translate as enlightenment in that way. You don't actually hear a lot about vidya. You hear a lot about avidya, about the lack of vidya. You hear, that's ignorance. And the opposite of ignorance is usually defined as bodhi. So those are usually your, your opposites there, ignorance, avidya, and bodhi. But I do want you to know that there is a word that's just vidya, a kind of illumination in that way. But again, they don't really talk about it too much in Buddhism. What you get is a kind of a, a sort of type of bodhisattva called a vidyadhara a holder of vidya and well anyways it, that's kind of a little subset of bodhisattvas and you don't hear too much about them in the mainstream so we're going to leave vidya to the side but i do tanya in particular wants you to know there is a word and there is a language in buddhism about light and about enlightenment but it's not bodhi um and so yeah there is something a little lost and, and thanks for the uh, pr priming it, because I will come back to the dream analogy, Tanya, soon. Okay, so there's another important word that I want to talk about, and that's nirvana. So nirvana is, you know, often considered the goal of Buddhism. Like if for, you know, kind of um, your average person on the street, if you asked them, hey, like what's what's Buddhism all about? Probably my guess would be so a lot of people would know, oh, it's about reaching nirvana or attaining nirvana, right? Probably. And so let's talk about that. Now, nirvana, of course, is not enlightenment, although I have seen it basically equated with enlightenment. So let's talk about nirvana. It, it'll be a very important. Uh, connector for a deeper understanding of bodhi, if we understand nirvana. So this Sanskrit nirvana, this Pali word nibbana, um, as many of you may know, the word literally means blown out. And the, the, it's not just the connotation of the word, but be, it's seemingly before the Buddha used this word to describe well, he used it to describe it a number of different things, but it, they're all kind of very spiritual, if you will, or about practice. But before the Buddha took this word, nirvana or niban would be if you blew out a candle, just if, if it, or if your if your um, if your campfire went out, if it had had, had died out, that's niban, and it's actually something kind of almost. Um, well, it's interesting in many ways for the Buddha, you know, everybody's coming up to this enlightened Buddha and talking about like, oh, what'd you figure out? What'd you figure out? What's the truth? And for him to say, Nibbana, <laughs> it's sort of like uh, uh, Nibbana, <laughs> but <laughs> that's like when my campfire goes out, that's like when, but <laughs> Well, what about the, you know, the lights and this and this and that? So nirvana is this kind of goal of Buddhism, if you will. And well, let's just get deeper into what nirvana was all about. So nirvana sort of deals with one or two or three different ideas. I'll start with the most kind of basic and mainstream of them, then we'll get to a little more technical and then a little more kind of esoteric, if you will. So the basic idea, and I'm putting this, by the way, you know, I want to say this again. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm generalizing and summarizing a lot of information to try to uh, make this clear in that way. So first of all, if it's not getting clearer, stop me. And B, let it be known that I'm leaving out a tremendous amount of information. 
But the basic idea is this, and this shouldn't sound too unfamiliar to any of you. There's these kleshes, as they're called. There's these afflictions or these defilements of the mind. They're usually transited as greed, anger, and delusion, right? Uh, uh, raga, dvesha, moha. I kind of prefer the definitions of attraction, aversion, and confusion. So those are the three kleshas. And those are the three defilements of the mind, which is to say they're kind of the culprits of suffering, the culprits of angst, the culprits of fear, terror, all everything, all of the dukkha in a sense, is being caused by these three defilements of the mind. And so the practice is about, well, eventually kind of eradicating or bringing those three defilements to nothing, to cessation in that sense, to what was called nirodha. And so what the Buddha talks about, and there's a great sutra, I often mention it, or I've been mentioning it a lot lately. It's a very early Buddhist sutta. It's a Pali sutta. Um, it's usually translated as the fire sutra, and it's the one where the Buddha talks about that the eyes and the ears and the nose and the tongue and the body and the brain are on fire with desire, with attraction, on fire with anger, and on fire with confusion. And so these sensory organs of ours in, in particular, the brain mind burns like with this wanty desirousness. I often, you know, describe it as a kind of like, like ed, we're like uh, addicts. We're like addicted to desire. And it's like, we're like, oh, we're burning with this wantiness and a burning with anger and burning with confusion. And so when the Buddha describes it like burning like a fire, nirvana is the the putting out of the flames of desire, anger, and confusion. In other words, the cessation of the three kleshas. If one successfully eradicated the three kleshas, one was, quote, in nirvana, in a state of peaceful, tranquil cessation. And there's a way in which for the Hinayana, that's the goal. That's what the Buddha came to tell us. We burn with desire, anger, and confusion. Here's the path to cessation. And so nirvana is or was, depending on your school of Buddhism, is or was the goal. Like that's where this is all headed. So that's nirvana within the basic framework regarding the three kleshas. There's a more kind of technical definition that has to do with something called asrava. And asrava is usually translated as outflow. And then there's a state of being called anasrava, no outflows. And in the Hinayana, in the early school, and still today in the Theravada Buddhist tradition, the, the path, in particular, the path of the arhat. An arhat is someone who is in nirvana and the idea of what they have put out is the ashrava, the outflows. And the outflows are also about sensual desire in this way. But there's a, a kind of a really interesting thing about this outflow because they it, remember this is i'm describing this from the point of view of early buddhism hinayana buddhism the monastic path solely monastic path and what they're talking about with outflows is they it's a really kind of interesting idea but they actually see desire in that sense kama k-a-m-m-a -M -M -A, kama as literally kind of flowing out of the sensory organs kind of oozing and this oozing this ashrava 
it can be very like subtle to where you're, it's like just sort of a tension, if you will, or something like that. And then that outflow of desire can, well, it could turn into semen and be ejaculated. And one of the main ashravas for the early Buddhist monastics, one of the main outflows was the outflowing of, of semen. It was like, <laughs> it was desire incarnate. It was desire in physical form coming out of your body, actually as a physical manifestation of desire. And therefore, in the early Buddhist tradition, it was actually a hallmark or a sign that you have achieved the state of an arhat if you no longer emitted semen. And actually, if you were actually no longer even capable of um, having an erection and even having sex, it was, your, your outflowing had ceased to that degree. I'm starting to introduce this I early Buddhist idea of nirvana as it pertains to desire, as it pertains to sexuality, because that's sort of very much indicative of that early Hinayana school. And it's actually what the Mahayana is not entirely into, that kind of really um, uh, monastic form of practice in that way, exclusively. It's so basically, um, as I often like to say, from the Mahayana point of view, the early Buddhists are obsessed with sex. Now they are telling you not to have it. They're telling you how defiled it is. They're telling you what a problem it is to your practice. But man, oh man, are they going to talk about lust and sex a lot? <laughs> so it's kind of funny that they're so obsessed with that, which that is such a problem in that way. So. One other definition of nirvana has to do with the, the, the cessation of desire, but to that degree, to the degree of zero sexuality in that sense. And, you know, the Buddha is sort of known for having supposedly said that if there was a desire stronger than sex, he wouldn't have achieved enlightenment or awakening, if you will. So there's a way in which early Buddhism at least really kind of, well, they respect the, the power of the sex drive and they spent a lot of time in the early days dealing with the sector, sex drive. So, yeah, Tanya. <laughs> Maybe this is a weird question, but did the early monastics, like did they use any herbs or take anything to try to like tamp down desire or was it all just like through meditation practice the only thing i can think of right off the top of my head is the prescription to avoid stimulating things like things that we would consider aphrodisiacs and things like that so i don't off the top of my head i can't think of any prescriptions that would diminish it but definitely prescriptions to avoid things that would stimulate it yeah okay so one more i just want to introduce one more interesting um thing about nirvana if that if that word if we understand that word to mean the uh the blowing out or the cessation in that way and in some traditions the blowing out or the cessation is of the three kleshas in some, it's of the ashravas, the outflows. And then in others, it's something called the taints. Um, forget, these might even be, well, regardless, there's this idea of the four taints as well. And the four taints are, once again, the taint of kama, of sensual desire but also the desire for existence, the desire to have a view, a drishti, and the desire, um, well, it's not really the desire, but it's because of desire, but ignorance, the aforementioned avidya. 
So those four things, ignorance, um, having a view, so being ignorant, having a view, being attached to existence, and being kind of desirous for sensual pleasures. Those four things are these taints, and those are also in some traditions what are eradicated in nirvana, what are ceased in nirvana. And in particular, these four things are considered the four things that keep us coming back for more. And what I mean by that is this cycle of birth, death, and rebirth, otherwise known as samsara, what keeps us kind of bound in the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth are those four things. And I kind of, I might've mentioned this last week, but I'll mention it again. Before the Buddha and in other Indian traditions, the general idea of why we keep getting reborn is because of past karma that we sort of have to work out that we did a bunch of stuff in the past and the things that we did in the past need to play themselves out. And so if we do things, then we're kind of fated or bound to rebirth. And so watch what you do, watch what you say, because it's going to affect your future rebirth. The Buddha came along and in the wisdom of awakening that we're going to get back to, like what is awakening, but in that it, enlightenment, what the Buddha seems to have realized or what he taught was that we are not, we don't keep coming back because of past karma. We keep coming back because we want to. We love it here that there, we are actually so addicted to sensual desire, which is the first taint, that given the next possible opportunity, we dive back into the sensual realm for more. So it's not that we're being kind of punished for our past action. We're getting exactly what we want in that way. So that's a taint, or at least it's, it's the thing that's one of the things that's keeping us in the cycle. Cause again, we're keeping ourselves in the cycle in that sense. The second one, which is actually the craving for existence. So that's even crazier. Cause that's not even that we we come back because we like the, the toys here we come back to exist, to be in that way. And that's considered a taint. And the eradication of that taint is what gets you off the wheel of samsara. And that kind of makes, from that metaphysical point of view, it makes perfect sense. If you don't want to come back anymore and you're kind of totally done and over being, that would eliminate the karma, so to speak, that would bring you back. Interesting, though, there's two more taints that would keep you bound in samsara, keep you suffering and all of that. And that's having a view or even in a way of desiring attachment to a view or a drishti. And the last one, ignorance, which will be a great segue to bring us back to awakening. So, but the view problem. I want to really stress this one because it does, it's one of those ones that doesn't get talked about enough within kind of Buddhist discourse. And while being attached to physical objects, being attached to wealth, being attached to stuff is one form of attachment, and it's one to be overcome in that sense. Then there's attachment to self, which you could basically substitute as existence in that way. So the taint of, of the, the desire for existence is attachment to self in that way. So being attached to stuff, being attached to self, and then the third form of attachment, being attached to views, being attached to opinions, being attached to worldviews, that that's something that keeps us bound in the cycle, keeps us suffering. And this is one of the, one of the most subtle things to work on as a Dharma practitioner, because, you know, I talk about views a lot. These they are called a drishti, a gaze, but it's like a worldview. And there's, it's so deep that worldviews 
you know, I often like to say, everybody's got one. <laughs> Even if you like think, you know, whatever it's, that's your view. <laughs> it's, you know, so you can have a Christian view and you think God created the world and God's overlooking us and, and we're all going to heaven or some people are going to heaven and hell. That's a worldview. You might think that we're just um, uh, fancy dirt dancing around, biochemically electrified dirt dancing around. That's a view. Um, you Any number of things. You take your pick. It's all a view. And what's fascinating about Buddhism as a, phil as a philosophy, as a religion, as a whatever, is that one of its main things is about not being attached to views, not, ha not having a fixed view. And what's so wild about that is it can become a fixed view so easily. And the Buddha knows that, and Buddhism knows that, and it's a part of that for the deeper, further practice, which is to even not get attached to that idea <laughs> that attachment to views is a problem. This is all like middle path territory stuff, right? Where it's like, ah, there's this middle path between all of this. So that's the idea of views that this, this attachment to views, and, and you know about views. You know, I mean, it's, they're everywhere, but political views are some of the most popular in that way. And you see what, you see where that leads. <laughs> you see where political views get us. And there's something really wise about not attachment, no attachment to views, right? All right, so... And again, having one is what keeps us bound in that way. And then the fourth thing that keeps us bound, of course, is ignorance. This should come as no surprise if you've been studying Dharma. But this will, again, this is a good segue back to our idea of awakening. Before I go full segue back to awakening, though, there's one more word that I want to mention. And it's the word uh, moksha or vimoksha. The Buddhists tend to use just, or tend to use vimoksha. Within the um, uh, Upanishads, within the kind of um, uh, either Advaita Vedanta or just Vedanta, just sort of the Vedic tradition of India, you will usually just hear about moksha. But vimoksha, moksha, it's the same basic word, and it means release. Uh, liberation, freedom. So moksha or vimoksha is a little tricky. And I haven't actually seen it in the Buddhist tradition be equated with or even considered the goal. It's a means or a way to get to the goal, but in and of itself, it's not a goal or it's not the goal. I say that because if you're familiar with like classical, again, Upanishadic thought or even kind of Patanjali Yoga Sutra stuff, moksha liberation is sort of what it's all about. Like it is kind of the goal. The Buddhists are a little different about it. And I, I would say that that's for a number of different reasons. Their idea of liberation, though, is interesting because in the more Upanishadic tradition, there's sort of this notion of the, well, of either Maya, the illusion, or Lila, the great play. But there's this idea of like the realm of the illusion. Hi, welcome to the realm of illusion. And moksha is liberation from that. And you're, you're out of it. You're gone. And in some traditions, that's union with Brahma. Some it's, you know, just union with the divine in some sense. But it's very much in the Upanishadic tradition and, and kind of that broad family of yoga. Moksha is definitely about being out of maya. So bye, <laughs> you're gone. Vimoksha in Buddhism, which is basically the same word, 
but it's very different seemingly in Buddhism because for the most part, you're not, you're not going anywhere. You're, you're still right where you were, but you are liberated from it in that way. And now we you just go back to what I just said about desire, anger, confusion, and you're liberated of those things, but you're liberated right here, right now. So it's a kind of a different understanding of moksha or vimoksha in that way. And you should know too, by the way, normally the term vimoksha is used in Buddhism to describe the four jhanas and the four formless jhanas. So those eight, the progress of those eight meditative states, those are usually called vimokshas, like in the plural. So they're different states of this kind of liberation. Okay, so let's get back to awakening as the sort of probably the, the main idea that enlightenment is trying to capture. So back to this idea of bodhi, right, awakening. And uh, here's where I, I want to interject uh, an important point. So last week I said, I, I started working with this paradigm of Hinayana Mahayana, early Buddhism, late Buddhism, kind of an idea. The Arhat path and the Bodhisattva path is another way to think of them. A, another difference or a difference between these two paths it kind of has a, a little bit to do with, it has a little bit to do with the, the dual Buddhist practices of shamatha and vipassana, calming down and insight. Shamatha, calming down, is what we call meditation, right? The practice of sitting, Mindful breathing, sati, mindfulness, leading to dhyana, leading to samadhi, leading to nirodha, stillness. That's all the realm of shamatha. And then over here, you have these insights, vipassana, insights like no self, insights like impermanence, insights like the Four Noble Truths. <laughs> so those are realizations. Oh, that's what's causing my suffering. Oh, there's no self. Oh, everything's impermanent. <laughs> those are insights. And then there's the calming down. And when we talk about nirvana, and actually even the way that I've talked about nirvana, the general focus is on shamatha. And what I mean by that is, is that the whole thing is about em emotionally calming down. Yes, calming down in a physical way. Like if you were seething and heat, and you were like, ah, 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 and you calmed down, there's that calm. But there's miles to go before we're calm because there's all kinds of other more subtle emotional things that need to be calmed down. And so the idea is, is that what I basically, what I'm getting at is, is that Nirvana, Nirvana is about calming down. Nirvana is about emotional balance. Nirvana is about that kind of stillness in that way. And at least as far as Nirvana is discussed, as far as it is described as all of that, there's not a lot about insight going on with nirvana. It's much more about the calming and in particular dealing with greed, anger, and confusion in that sense. Bodhi, uh, especially anuttara samyak sambodhi, the, this thing that we're defining or we're translating as awakening, that's all insight. It, it's that's awakening is insight territory. But here's the thing about it. Buddhism has always been and is always a dual practice 
of calming down and gaining insight. It has always been that. I often like to say that you can have just a calming practice and that's sort of traditional yoga of calming down. And you can do that without any you know, knowledge or insight or realizations because it's actually about stopping the mind from thinking. <laughs> It's actually about being in a state of mental stillness. So calming with no insight is like, again, classical yoga meditation. You can also have insight with no calming, with no physical practice. And that's basically the way Western science is done. It's pure insight. It's pure realizations. Oh my gosh, it's all quirks. But the whole science has no physical practice. And of course, if you're a scientist in your lab coat, the whole tradition of Western science, it doesn't assume you would need to do meditation before you go to the laboratory. That is not a part of the way Western science thinks. It, 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 it's the whole kind of structure of Western science where the observer the mental state of the observer doesn't have anything to do with this. It's the Bunsen burners and the beaker and all of that. That is the science. So again, you can have a, an insight tradition with no calming and you can have a calming tradition with no insight. What's beautiful about Buddhism is it's a science and a meditation tradition yoked together in union in that way. It's a beautiful tradition for that, by the way, with this heavy emphasis on, on what we would call the, the, the scientific process or just inquiry, deductive reasoning, all of that. So it's very scientific, but very knowledgeable about physiology, psychology, and the need to calm down to even understand these things. So always in tandem. However, the Hinayana and now this is where I'm about to say something incredibly general. So generalized, I shouldn't even say it. But it's a general, general idea. The early tradition, the Hinayana school, the focus is on the calming. And the, the idea is, is that the calming, the calming, the calming will bring about the insights. So there is so much emphasis on the meditation practice, on sati, on mindfulness, on breathing, on dhyana, on samadhi. And it's the idea is, is that you kind of almost need to calm down first. And I I'll actually, I should add this as well. It's also an understanding of the early tradition, which is, it's very yoga and by that i mean it's very old indian yoga early buddhism also it was a very uh heavy ethical moral component so this is where the precepts come in this is where shila comes in this is where moral discipline comes in so this is where monasticism comes in heavy discipline heavy meditation heavy self control and you could gain the insight you're not calm enough, you're not morally pure enough to understand this stuff, says the early school. So calm down, work on your, your, your karma, your moral, your, your moral ethical situation, and through the practice of morality and meditation, you can gain these insights. Or do this and you can understand the insights. Like you may not have them yourself, but you could read about them and understand what they mean if you do the practice. Again, that is a very, very, very gr gross generalization of, of Hinayana and the early practice, but there is this emphasis on meditation and morality and all of that. The Mahayana comes along, and I said this last week too, Mahayana Buddhism is very, very, very old. <laughs> and, you know, to... To th even for me to call it late Buddhism is really a not is inappropriate because it's so contemporaneous with what we call the Hinayana. So 
I just want to point that out that neither of these schools or traditions or even trends has any priority in history. They have priority culturally in different ways. So the Mahayana has this different approach. And in general, what I would say is that what makes the Bodhisattva path, the Bodhisattva path, and what makes Mahayana Mahayana is the starting point is the insight and the wisdom. And it's actually this really, the Bodhisattva path in particular is this really interesting technique where these certain contemplations, empty, the emptiness, the concept of emptiness being the foremost among them, but certain insights, certain contemplations bring about morality, bring about a state of calm, bring about equanimity or upeksha. And it does it by leading with the wisdom. And the basic idea as I, as a historian, when I look at the long history of Buddhism, it really does seem like the Buddha in the first period was really dealing with children, wild, crazy children, sex-driven, wild teenagers, where it was really about calm down, calm down, be morally pure, calm down, be morally pure. And then there's these insights. But you fast forward either, you know, if you're the type of person that thinks this all happened in the lifetime of the Buddha, then you fast forward to Buddha in his, maybe his 60s and in his 70s, right? Remember the guy died in his 80s. So, you know, in his middle period, he seems to have started treating people more like adults in that way and actually giving this wisdom. And again, it is such powerful wisdom that it induces and brings about morality and calm. Now, I'm not, not saying there's not a meditative aspect to Mahayana Buddhism. Of course there is. But what I'm getting at is, is that in the dual practices, the early Hinayana emphasizes the physical seated practice. And then they offer attaining these insights versus Mahayana kind of doing it with a other emphasis. The emphasis is on the wisdom and the insight. And then you do the practice kind of in tandem with it. It's, it's really a slight matter of emphasis, but once the emphasis is made, it goes. It goes really far, is what I guess what I want to say. Okay, questions, comments, answers, ideas about that. Before we talk about the awakening of the Mahayana. Okay, so that brings us fully to this idea of Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi. So not just Bodhi, not just awakening, but the highest unsurpassable state of awakening. I said last week, Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi equals the awakened state of a Buddha. So that's the word is describing the state of a fully awakened being. And that state, Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, is the state that the Bodhisattva makes a vow to attain while simultaneously making a vow to deliver or, or bring all sentient beings to that same state of awareness. And so we really, tonight, or for the remainder of tonight, I want to really start massaging how it is that those are the same thing. <laughs> Attaining Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi oneself and guaranteeing that all sentient beings achieve it as well, and how those are actually the same thing. So the first thing, of course, is that I mentioned this as well last week, that within the Hinayana schools of thought, a Buddha is a very rare occurrence. They appear in the world very, very rarely. Even if they appear in the world, your chance to meet one is very, very rare. And 
actually, even within the early Hinayana schools, some of the early Hinayana schools didn't even think the Buddha was from this planet. They didn't think he was from this dimension. So let it be known that there are early Hinayana schools that basically denied the hum humanity of the Buddha. They're not the ones that survived per se, like the Theravada tradition did, because the Theravada tradition was one of the schools that was very, very clear that the Buddha was a per just a person, just, just somebody like you and me. So, however, in the Hinayana, the Theravada in particular, that human being of a Buddha, that only happens like once every couple of several kalpas. <laughs> so he might as well be from another planet. <laughs> he might as well be from another dimension if it happens that infrequently. And so what happens in the Hinayana, in the Theravada, is that the Buddha is the great guru, the great teacher who came to turn the Dharma wheel, who came to tell us all of this information and passed away. And then we can follow the path of the teachings and achieve the goal. And within the Theravada tradition, you could achieve the state of an arhat, of a worthy one. Of course, within the Theravada tradition, there's this problem of patriarchy. And so if you're a woman, sorry, you're going to have to go through the entire process so that you could get re reborn as a man and go through the whole process again and do it right. Then you get to be an arhat. Sorry. So that's in the Theravada tradition. So things happen in that tradition. Yeah, Tanya. <clears throat> That's still the case for some of the Theravada to this day, right? Oh, sure. Yeah, the Theravada is pretty patriarchal that way. They preserve the sexism, if you will. I'll just call it what it is. They preserve that. <clears throat> and they have um, certain cultural traditions. Um, the most famous one is the, the idea that a, that a, if a nun has been a nun for 80 years and a monk just got ordained that day, the nun still has to bow to the monk versus a seniority, a kind of a seniority bowing, which would be nice at least. But so anyways, Theravada has those cultural problems, but I'm not here to throw Theravada under the bus and do that to him. I'm really not, you know? Yeah, no. Uh, when you said that the in the Theravadan tradition, the Buddha might as well be from another planet, did you mean that um, there's because they're so rare, so it's not like anyone else in the life of a Buddha or even in the historical knowledge of the Buddha can aspire to be a Buddha because it's just so rare. Is that what you meant by that? Or yep, and there's some sort of um, metaphysical prohibition against there being two Buddhas in a realm at the same time. Okay. I was just going to ask about that. Yeah. yeah. So it's not like statistically, there could be two Buddhas at once, even if they're three kalpas apart on average, but you're saying that in fact, there can't be because yep. there's a prohibition against Okay. Again, yeah. This is all sort of in the land of Buddhology, okay. <clears throat> which is this study of, <clears throat> excuse me, study of Buddhas. But that's, that's the idea. So again, in the Theravada, Buddha is the great guru, totally untouchable in that sense. And again, the whole path then becomes one of following the path that he laid down in that way. The Mahayana tradition has a, a very different understanding of Buddha and therefore kind of a very just different understanding of what's going on here. So there are now, you know, Mahayana Buddhism is a very big category, lots of different traditions underneath that umbrella. So this gets really, really tricky to, you almost can't even generalize it, you know, but the idea is, well, simply put, 
the basic idea is, is that every sentient being in the Mahayana, every sentient being has the capacity to be a Buddha. And not only that, actually in the grand scheme of things, all sentient beings will all eventually become fully enlightened Buddhas, but at different rates, so is the basic idea. So that's kind of a different starting point to begin with, for sure. But that has to do with the entirely different starting point kind of of the Mahayana in general. And that's, well, I'm going to pull back because I need to stay focused on what I want to talk about. I don't want to get too carried away. So let's more clearly define this idea of awakening. Let's more clearly understand why Buddhism bodhisattvas are seated on lotus flowers, for example, and what that whole metaphor is about. So Tanya alluded to it at the beginning of my talk. She mentioned that I often use these analogies of the dream scenario. Um, and I like using the dream as an example because it's such a great example of avidya, of ignorance. And I like to use the dream as an example of ignorance because what it's about is, is when you're in a dream, but you think it's reality. You, you think it's just another day in your life, but it's not. But you're acting as if it is. You're behaving as if it is. You're responding as if it is. And that's ignorant. That's, that's confused. That's not really what's going on. And of course, the, the idea I have in mind is you're having a nightmare and you're very worried about something. You're very worried that something's like coming to get you. And then you wake up in, in the next morning, you wake up and you're like, oh, I had no reason to be afraid. But I didn't know it at the time. And that's being ignorant. <laughs> so a dream, we get kind of a, this kind of like a little case study of ignorance every night in that way, at least when we're having dreams and responding to them as if they're reality. So last week I set up a scenario and I wanted, I used the dream, a dream as, as an analogy to try to describe total delusion and suffering, the state of an arhat, and then the bodhisattva path. So I wanted to lay out those three paths using the dream as an analogy. And the dream, what it looks like is this. So let's say I'm going to make, I'm going to make up a scenario right here, right now that, um, so I'm fortunate to have a, a really great landlord, really great landlord, right? Hasn't always been the case in my life. And so let's say it was one of those situations where I had a bad landlord or somebody I really didn't like. And then let's say one night I go to sleep and then I find myself in a dream and I run into my landlord in the dream. But I think it's just another day in the life of Michael, right? And so then I'm like, oh, there he is. Arr. I'm getting angry because, oh, the landlord, right? So I'm in this dream scenario and I'm having this emotion of anger and, and my, what I think is my stomach hurts. And it's like, ah, right? So that's total delusion because I'm in a dream and it's not my landlord, but I think it's him. And so I'm angry and I don't know any better. So that's total delusion and suffering as a result. Now let's say in this scenario, in my analogy, that the dreamer becomes lucidly aware that they're dreaming while they're dreaming. So they have a lucid dream and they realize, oh, this is a dream, right? So here's the idea. The dreamer realizes and says, oh, wow, this is a dream. That's not really my landlord. It's not him. It's, it's empty. It's a fiction. It's, it's whatever. 
And so I'm not angry. I have no reason to be angry at a phantasm. This isn't even real. And so the dreamer is now kind of an arhat in that they have put an end to their anger. And because they're lucid, lucidly aware it's a dream, they've overcome the confusion. And they wouldn't pursue um, things in this realm because they know they're not real, right? So just a little mini scenario, but of an arhat in a dream because they become lucid and they're no longer angry. However, the situation is still one of the arhat peacefully enduring the phantasm, the, the dream figure of their landlord. <laughs> and they're cool, they're chill about it, but there's still this idea of the landlord. What I suggested last week is the bodhisattva out of wisdom realizes that that image of their landlord that they're seeing in that dream is an aspect of their of themselves in fact the entire dream is an aspect of themselves and so not only is it completely ridiculously foolish to be heaping and throwing anger at myself all night long but what if i extended loving kindness to what I think is my landlord. That would fill my dream world with loving kindness. Well, that would be kind of cool, wouldn't it? To be in a world filled with loving kindness. It's better than being in a world or a body or a mind filled with anger. And that's what the Bodhisattva realizes. Anger only hurts themselves. It never actually gets to the person and does whatever we would hope it would do, right? Devastate them, make them beg for our forgiveness, right? Is that what we want, right? I want my landlord to beg like, oh, I'm so sorry, I was a bad landlord. Is that what I think is happening when I'm angry at my landlord that they will, that they will be like, oh my God, you are right. I've been such a jerk this whole time, Michael. Your anger showed me the way. I don't actually think that that's go what's going to happen. So the idea, again, is that in the dream scenario, there's total delusion and suffering, the chilled out arhat who can tolerate everything, or the bodhisattva who's actually making the proactive move of extending love and kindness and compassion towards themselves or towards what they understand as their own mind. Okay, everybody feeling okay about that dream scenario? Because I'm then gonna take it a little further. I also mentioned this last week, but I wanna kind of really reinforce this idea. So now let's take this out of the analogy of a dream and let's make this very practical about our actual lives that we live every day. <laughs> Same things going on though. We can be totally deluded and confused about what's going on here and be angry about all kinds of things. It's the default mode. We can have moments of insight or lucidity and realize the, 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 that the move is upeksha, the move is equanimity, peaceful tranquility, being chill with the world. That is the move. That's again, that's, that would be Hinayana. That's the early path. The Bodhisattva path in this realm, though, in this world, it's about this. And this is what I talked about last week. So last week, I think I used the example of my father. So not my landlord, but my father. And here's the deal. What I talked about last week is the realization that, that I, Michael, <laughs> I had a number of years ago where I realized that this person that I, that, that I run into, that I meet, that I go to Thanksgiving, to their house for Thanksgiving, this person that I call my father, that person is 
my father. And what I mean by that is that that person is, is, is the idea I have of that person from the perspective of being that person's child, being that person's son. And what I talked about last week was that how my mother, she has an entirely different relationship with that guy. And that's because, you know, she, you know, she fell in love with this uh, Air Force guy on the beach one day and, and probably still always sees him as that, that young Air Force guy on the beach, right? And has an entirely different relationship with him and probably even literally sees him differently than I do, different than my sister does, different than all these different people do. And when you realize that the version that you have of somebody is uniquely your own version and nobody else has that version and they can't. Again, my version came from being actually down here and my father being way up there. And, you know, even ideas of fear of my father because he kind of, you know, was over me and all of that. But that's all dependent upon me. And so what I realized one day was that that my father is an aspect of my own mind in a very, very, very deep way. And that realization actually is what opened up wide portholes, portals of ability to extend loving kindness and compassion to not just my father, but to, to everybody in that way. But, you know, having that breakthrough with somebody like your father figure is a big one. When you, and by the way, too, from a very personal point of view, this realization also helps with forgiveness in a lot of ways. Um, just going to put that out there. So the point is, when the Bodhisattva, out of wisdom, recognizes this aspect of our reality, which is that we are actually both sides of our experience in a really, really profound, deep way. And we can either be delusional and ignorant of that, and then out of anger and stuff, kind of keep boxing ourselves into a delusion in that sense, right? So we could keep doing that. We could be equanimous. Yes. And this is where I say it again. I'm not throwing the Theravada under the bus, giving everybody the tools to be equanimous and peaceful and tranquil. That's it. That's great. The Mahayana though, <laughs> the Bodhisattva path though. Wow. That would truly save the world. The Hinayana I said this last week, the Hinayana is good for your karma. It's good for your mind. It's good for your body. The Mahayana, good for everybody and you included. It's like a twofer. It's like a in, 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 in infinity of fur. In, is there, so you, get the, you get it all for, not even, not even two. Okay. <laughs> all right. Everybody doing good? Questions, comments, answers, ideas? Yeah, no. There's a question in the chat. Oh, cool. Look, thank you for pointing that out. I'll try to do it. What's... Oh, what's I'm not exactly sure what you mean by those dreams. Just any old dream, lucid dreams. Regardless, I'll um, attempt to answer just that general idea. Um, you know, because especially when you get into Mahayana Buddhism, there's not just as a um, upaya or a teaching device, like I use it, um, the dreams, dreams are used not just as an upaya, but the dream space or the dream state becomes a very important one for Mahayana Buddhism. And what I mean by that is, is it, 
it's very um Uh, how can I put this? Well, for the most part, Mahayana Buddhism, I don't know exactly what the uh, Theravada slash Hinayana position on dreams is. I've actually never really um, went looking for that in the Pali Canon or anything. So I'm really only going to be able to refer to Mahayana, but dreams are, are, it's all kind of understood basically like this. <laughs> we tend to create this, I wanna use my words carefully. We create this situation where this is reality and at night we dream. And like, that's, that's like a, that's over there. From the kind of the Buddhist point of view, it's all kind of a continuum of a continuum of consciousness, vacillations of consciousness. So if you want to think of that as this is the most vivid dream you're having. <laughs> so in, what I mean is if you want to think of this as dreamlike or a dream, and it's just part of the same continuum of nighttime dreams, you could do it that way. Or if you wanted to kind of call this reality, you can call that reality as well. If that makes sense. And that's what I mean by consciousness is it's a continuum of consciousness here. They're not different states. It's sort of just um, gradations, if you will, of a consciousness, um, which actually, by the way, I will... Yeah, actually, let me do this. I want to, and I hope that kind of at least addresses the question that was asked about dreams and all of that. I just meant to say that there's a lot of overlap um, in that way. And so when maybe we have prescient dreams, which is what the question seemed to be alluding to, um, that's not a big surprise in Mahayana. <laughs> that's like, well, yeah. So, but I did want to point out just one last thing to kind of make a even firmer, clearer statement about enlightenment or awakening. So the state of Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, the most supreme, unsurpassable, enlightened state of a Buddha. If I wanted to kind of just put that right back into my analogy of the dreams, which I had three dreams, I had the deluded dream, the arhat dream, and the bodhisattva dream. I'm going to add a fourth and mention the Buddha dream. So one, again, is totally being ignorant and suffering as a result. The next is sort of being peacefully tranquil with what's going on. And the idea of that, which again, I'm kind of saying that's the arhat path, being peacefully tranquil with what's going on there's a sense in which that there's still a dualistic subject, object, self, and other situation going on there. So if I'm tolerant of you, <laughs> that, that's subject, object, okay? So that's sort of the idea of that arhat dream where we are peacefully tolerant of everything and we are very upekshic or equanimous, but there's still a sense of me, the arhat, <laughs> who is the equanimous one in this world of idiots. I am so peaceful or whatever it is. So there's still a subject object going on. That's where the bodhisattva is a little deeper in the realm of non-duality because the bodhisattva is saying, oh, wow, this feeling I have of being just on the receiving end of all of this, that's a delusion. That's an interesting byproduct of attachment, that it feels like you're just on the receiving end. So the idea is, is that's where the bodhisattva gets, gets to the real work of, and this is done, by the way, of course, through social engagement. It's done through dana, through giving. It's done through empathy. It's gone through listening, giving attention. But there's a way in which through the practice of all of those things, like giving, there is a dis 
a dissolution of the attachment to self. I'm not going to say a dissolution of self because there is no self. There's just the dissolution of the attachment to self. And that again is the bodhisattva practice. And we do that by recognizing that all of these people are aspects of our own mind and we can either be angry at them, peacefully tranquil towards them, or actually be kind towards ourselves. But even the bodhisattva in say either the dream or in practice is still in that way diluted of subject and object and still giving in that way. But then there are practices where the bodhisattva is supposed to in a way give without reflecting on gift giver or recipient. So there's techniques of really massaging this self out of us. And the idea is, is that if I wanted to use the lucid dream analogy. And remember, I've already tried to make it clear that lucidity, uh, like being lucidly aware, oh, this is a dream. That's kind of like awakening, kind of like awakening. In the dream, it's a lucid dream. Now, this is where I'm really kind of basically hoping that you've had a lucid dream or you've, you know about them at least, because as someone who has explored that space a little bit, what's interesting is, is that there's then stages, if you will, to understanding the dream. And what I mean by that is, as soon as you have your first lucid dream, or once you start lucid dreaming, the interesting thing about it, and it's why I'm so interested in them as a, as a teaching for Buddhism, the idea is, is that when I'm in a situation where, and it's like, you know, whatever, somebody's coming to get me, or it's my landlord, or whatever it is, that moment when I go, oh, wow, this is a dream. Oh, I'm dreaming. The moment that happens, everything remains, at least for me, exactly like it was. The only difference is a radical emotional difference where I'm not afraid and I'm not desirous. It's, it's just a, a radical changing of the heart or the disposition. But again, in terms of the visual field or what is being experienced as the visual field, it's all just the same. What I mean is it's still subject object. As one goes down the bodhisattva path headed towards Buddhahood, the idea is, and now I'm, I'm, I'm using the lucid dream, only the lucid dream right now as an analogy. Imagine a lucid dream. If you get good at lucid dreaming, you, and if, if you are listening, anybody listening, if you've done lucid dreaming, you know, as you get better at it, you can um, change the reality of the dream more and more. You begin more, you get less diluted in the condition of subject object, and it frees you up to be able to sort of manipulate more of the dream. Well, the idea of Buddhahood within my dream analogy is arriving at that state of omniscience as it pertains to the dream where you would be total master of the dream world, which is your own mind. And at that point, a Buddha lucid dream could create any reality, kind of in a way manifest any reality they wish in that sense. The descriptions of a Buddha in this reality are not that much different in terms of Buddhas being omnipotent, omnipotent, omnipowerful, omniscient, all-knowing, right? And omnipresent everywhere. If, and again, let me, just for the sake of clarity, go back to the dream analogy really, really quickly. In the dream, in the lucid dream, remember, your your head's on the pillow you're here and the dream you are 
the entirety of the dream. Even though when you're in the dream, you feel like you're just one small part of a world and you're the receiver of it, but you actually are the whole thing. Mahayana Buddhism, at least, is saying the same thing is true of this current situation, where I know it feels like you're just on the sensorial receiving end, but you are actually the totality of it all. And this isn't crazy. This isn't like wild. This is actually, as I like to point out, what in the modern world calls phenomenology. Phenomenology is the idea that the phenomenal world that we experience is entirely our own in that way. So we are all sides of it. I'm suggesting as a def definition of enlightenment or awakening, Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi awakening, it's when you are fully embodying that totality <laughs> versus feeling just as if you were a little small speck in a world in that sense. Okay, that's going to be my last remark on what is enlightenment, or at least some interesting ideas about what it might be.